Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this FPNA Trends webinar, where today we're taking you through the FPNA maturity model, uh, in specific, achieving intelligent transformation, one of the new papers that we've done uh, this year. My name is Hans Gobin. I'm your FPNA Trends and International FPNA uh, Board Ambassador, and today I'll be your facilitator as well. Just to give you an idea, we've got a great number of people joining us uh, after summer. We've got around 620 uh, members and colleagues joining us through this session. So uh, let me start by taking you through what we have for you as agenda. So we'll look at the uh, fp and maturity model, an overview and what's new in this paper. We'll then go on to talk about um, intelligent transformation, uh, very specifically to do with Swarovski and their experience. We will also look at transformation during a period of hypergrowth, and this is to do with uh, Moderna. Um, and then finally, we'll close off the presentation rounds uh, through looking at how do you accelerate intelligent transformation within an organization. So quite some good stuff there we will close off with conclusion and recommendation and finally to the most exciting part or one of the exciting part which is the q a which will be coming from you um, people in the audience uh, so this is what's on the agenda now it is a great time for me to um, start introducing my panelists so members of the panel, if you don't mind, please join me on your webcam and come off mute whilst I introduce each one of you. Um, to start, or the first member of the panel is Francesco Canciania, who is former director, controlling excellence at Swarovski, uh, based in Zurich, Switzerland. And today he will share with us his experience within Swarovski. Um, Francesco, great to have you with us today. Happy to be here, Hans. Looking forward to the session. Thank you, Francesco. Our second presenter today will be Svetlana Sigalova, Vice President FPNA at uh, Moderna, based in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, US. And today she will take us through her model and how they've gone through hypergrowth and how they managed their transformation within that period. Svetlana, great to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Hans. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Moving on to our uh, last presenter for today will be Michael Judd, who's Senior Director of Finance Solutions at Board International, based in England, uh, Elmbridge, England, in the UK. And today he'll share with us accelerating intelligent transformation, a bit about technology, and how do you move on from there. Uh, Michael, great to have you with us today. Hi, Hans. Hi, everyone. Um, glad to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got three great presenters from different places around the world. Exciting insight to come and lots of uh, fantastic uh, bits and tips in their presentation. So, members of the panel, if you don't mind turning your webcam off, I've got a few uh, housekeeping slides to go through and then we will start our presentation. So, um, of course, FPNA Trends Group, you guys know about us. We are in 27 cities, 16 countries, four continents, and we've only uh, just started doing our face-to-face -face, um, uh, meetings as well. So this is after the summer, one of our uh, first online meetings. Let me just quickly remind you what we've got in store for you and how long this meeting is. It is going to take one hour. So please stay with us from beginning till the end. There is two very interesting polling questions that I'll take you through. Please vote. Um, it is a, a, an interactive session as far as Q&A is concerned. You've got the chat box, so please ask us as many questions as you can. Please also direct it to who you want the questions to be answered by. Uh, we will try and answer some of them live at the end. The others that we can't answer, we will answer them by email to you. So please do not hesitate. Just put your question through. We will answer all of them. Um, the presentation is available in the handouts for you to download uh, right now. 
If not, you will receive a copy of the recording as well as the presentation after the meeting. And finally, when I close the meeting, please just stay back for about 30 seconds and give us uh, your feedback on how well we did, but also what are the other subjects you would like us to discuss with you in the next meeting. Um, a very quick introduction to our technology partner today, who is Board. And of course, we all know Board. Uh, they are there to make sure that you reach your goals and drive digital transformation across your organization with their help. So thank you very much, Board, for making this possible today. A good time for me to just give you a general overview of our uh, latest paper, which is the FPNA Maturity Model Achieving Intelligent Transformation, sponsored by Board. FPNA Maturity Model started in 2016. We all know about it. Inputs comes from 27 boards in 16 countries. We did our first paper in 2020. Uh, this is the second paper which builds on that. It includes a lot of case studies, interviews, advice from leading practitioners. You can go and benchmark your company, but also there are plenty of tips that you can take uh, and put in practice so that you take your company to that next level. Uh, you will also discover uh, the concepts of HI planning. And as we spoke about, there's a big roadmap into intelligent transformation. Uh, you can see there is a link there for you to download the paper. When you get a chance, please go away and have a, a good read. Let me very briefly share with you what the, the model looks like. A lot of us have seen the maturity model. This is a slightly updated version. In the essence of time, I will not go into uh, very much big detail, but please remember we've got six swim lanes, which is leadership, functional skills, business partnering. The other three will come on the next page, and then we've got developing intermediate and leading stage. Um, the other three was process, data, and analytics. What's very important here and in this paper is we're trying to look at the leading stage, what organizations are doing in that uh, a space um, as far as intelligent transformation is concerned. So here you will see five different things that came out of um, our uh, paper. So integrated strategic financial operational plans, scenario management, driver-based planning, as far as processes is concerned, predictive predi uh, analytics, real-time collaborative platform. And we dive deeper into all of these elements in our paper. And finally, I leave you here with four graphs that shows generally in those um, that I've just spoken about, where do we pitch ourselves? Where are organizations? You can see the orange line and the red line is probably mostly predominant. So, which means that, you know, there are, you know, not a lot of companies doing it. But of course, the key thing to, for us is that there's plenty of chance for us to build uh, and learn and then move on to the next level of our maturity. <laughs> I will leave it here from my angle. Um, I would like to introduce our first presenter today, who is uh, Francesco uh, Conchania uh, from former director of controlling at Swarovski. And today he will take us through his experience at Swarovski. So Francesco, over to you, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Hans. <clears throat> Let me start sharing the, um, my experiences Barowski related to intelligent transformation. Well, um, for those who um, know or don't know, um, is Barowski, it is, it's an Austrian producer of crystal glass and um, also jewelry and accessories. It's, um, it's a family owned business with more than 120 years and it has a revenue size of approximately 2.7 billion euros. Um, to a starting point of this um, high-level introduction of the Sparowski experience on transformation was back in the time of perhaps 2019-20, um, where they had the, 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 the greatest transformation in their history related to, um, we can summarize in terms of one vision, one strategy and one team. What that means is the brand transformation, 
which is repositioning from premium to affordable luxury space, then aligned the end-to-end -end strategy between different business units like B2C and B2B, and have um, a one organization model, a centralized event, as opposed to um, having the different um, divisions in place like consumer goods or crystal separate. It's just one big organization centrally driven, and that was the situation and uh, related to the starting point in 2019-20. So if we move on to the, to the next slide, lead, lead us to where should we begin, right? I mean, we are in, in controlling or FP&A. Um, where should we start? There are different elements of Italian transformation that Hans already introduced related to process, analytics, technology, etc. But for, for us, it was uh, thinking crucially about Four, four areas. First, about business strategy and company value change. And why that? Because we need to know where exactly the company is. In these cases, Swarovski was focused on retail innovation and, and brand transformation. Second was the maturity model. Where are we? Right? If we are in the high growth, if we're declining. And don't forget, when that was launched in 2019, we, um, COVID-19 hit us, which was impacting financially in the turnaround revenue as well. Um, also, the third point, it's related to organizational setup. What I mean by that, it's we need to understand what sort of organization we have. It was a centralized, decentralized model. Certainly, we want more of a decentralized model to more centralized performance-driven model. And finally, the last point is crucial to, to understand before moving to any categories, uh, fp &A categories, to understand the performance management system. What I mean by that, how do we create an effective process to reward managers based on the new strategy and financial ambitions? So if we move on to the next slide, um, we have this, um, the, the starting point with redefinition of the performance management system to support this business transformation. So this slide, uh, what it's trying to say is that we have different angles on how we will tackle that and that was based on the new financial steering concept. Um, what was that is, is if we wanted to look at a standard way to commercially steer the company to retail lenses, traditional retail lenses, meaning re looking at the performance based on geography, based on channel offline, online, for instance, and multiple products. This concept, the redefinition of the concept was the definitely the foundation of what the future performance reporting planning and business performance analysis will be in the in the future back in 2020 and that is then can be categorized in these four elements related to managerial view moving from legal entity view performance to really commercially driven performance reporting landscape with this very um atomized resourcing test driven and great deal of Customization to more standard, well governed reporting, more static and manual reporting to more self serving enabled reporting, and um, silo, I will say, thinking and um, business unit driven, non standard business performance review, whereas more centralized, collaborated business process review. Um, and that was the, the, the intention with these four elements to address, right, in a high level. So if we move on to the next slide, we try to explain here how we did it. So in terms of the managerial view, we started to look at the business performance, as I said, based on the market, product, and channels, P&Ls, as opposed to just legal entity. Legal entity, P&Ls, as a um, balance sheet, and cash flow, and other financial estimates still are produced for specific legal compliance and audit reasons, for sure. Um, but it related to um, commercial performance was based on these um, categories. Second, in terms of reporting landscape, was standardization of that, which was um, related to the standardization of reports provided by the shared service center. We have that we achieved around 60% of reduction here compared to what it was at the beginning of the journey. Second was a uh, third point was related to develop for introduction, I would say, of self-service and dashboard reporting to commercial functions. Um, four element was to redesign the business performance review cycle based on the entire planning cycle we have from the top 
to the uh, the organization, board of directors, um, also um, board manage management, uh, global regions, etc. So we have a, a standard way of looking at our performance um, from top to to down. So if we move to the next um, slide, we will see um, try to summarize in very high level, obviously. Um, what was the lesson learned on this redefinition of the performance management system? But right? um, there are many and plenty. But, um, but if I would like to take two of them, um, I will say we, we really need to be able to focus our priorities um, at the first place. And the second focus point will be an execution, right? We know that if we look at all the elements of what we can change in FBA, uh, it could be data process, people, technology, uh, functional skills, etc. But not everything can be changed at once, and so we need to make sure that we we have the commitment from our management, we have our priorities right, and we really focus on delivering on this promise uh, as opposed to just uh, having the the strategy on a paper. No, so. Examples of these lesson learned more specifically could be related to functional skills, for instance. What I mean by that is the organizational people maturity, it takes time. It, it can be tackled by, by phases for sure. It can be addressed in one or two years, but I bit longer than that. Other example is business partnering, which is probably you want to think about a long hanging fruit in terms of intelligent transformation. That will be one of them, which is related to train your finance team now on those skills. Third point in process, uh, many times forgotten, right? We really need to understand our assist process and realize that to be is a moving target. What I mean by that is we need to have a com company reference model framework and plan year by year our well, to be deliverables, what, what we would like to be, right? It's a moving target always to be. And the four elements on lesson learned is related to that analytics area or topic. I put here the start small and room POCs. I give you two examples of that. For instance, establish data governance in place with clearly data owners and data stewards, and to drive end to end and the areas in controlling OFPNA, as you would like to call it. Second example will be starting a small and run proof of concept, like in, uh, for reporting and uh, standardization, introduction of RPNA or macros, any other enabler in place to be able to be more efficient and effective. And that's all from, from my side. Back to you, Hans. Francesco, thank you very much. Uh, a great presentation. You know, I like how you guys took everything and turned it on its head and looked everything from a performance perspective. But of course, you kept true to the maturity model whilst you went through um, all of that as well. So thank you very much for that. And. Uh, um, we now move on to our polling question. Um, we've learned from Francisco, let us learn from our audience now. So I'm now just about to launch our first polling question for the day, if you can vote please. So what is the biggest barrier that you guys face um, to moving to the next level of the maturity board? Is it around leadership? Is it around skill set processes, data and analytics or technology? If you can vote please, that will be uh very good so is it what is the biggest barrier your organization faces to move to the next level of the maturity leadership skill set process data and analytics or technology uh i will give it a few more seconds if you can vote please so is it leadership where we're facing um difficulty is it skill set is it processes is it data and analytics or finally is it uh, technology. I'm now going to uh, close this and share it with uh, our audience. So 22% of people think it's leadership where they're facing uh, a biggest barrier, 15% skill set, 21% process, 16% data and analytics, 26% technology. Uh, Francesco, uh, any insight from you as to what we're seeing here in terms of the polling? I think it, it it reflects what everybody is struggling when it comes to transformation, right? So for me, this confirms the fact that um, 
the most difficult part is uh, is people being uh, being able to adapt to rapid changes right adaptability is key here either if you're talking about as you said organization right going from one model to another technology impacting the way we operate or data turning that into insights or even uh, being you know from process perspective or business partner, you know, effective collaboration, build trusted organization, all of that is it, really a struggle, right? So um, we really need to, to adapt uh, ourselves in a, in a rapid way. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Uh, of course, technology leads right behind his leadership. So uh, from top, you know, it has to come from top. So thank you very much for voting. Thank you for your insight, Francesco. Let me just hide that and let's go on to look at the question you would like to ask the other members of the panel. So um, Svetlana and Michael, if you can join us as well, please. So considering the different elements of intelligent transformation we just saw in, in the last few slides, what will be your focus area during the next few years within your organization? Um, Svetlana, if I may ask you for your answer, yep. please. So we have worked through the foundational portion of the transformation and the next couple of years we're focusing really strongly on the digital and automation right so we're transitioning all of our business reports and we're envisioning a world where no powerpoint or email has to go from fpna fantastic thank you very much for that so digitalization is where you guys are heading thank you uh michael what will be your answer or your insight on this so i think um you know we're thinking about how we can enable new ways of working in the organization how we can bring technology there to sort of help that. So I guess I'd say introducing more intelligence into the planning process so that you can focus on the critical, you know, levers of the business and, and really go after those. Just introducing you. more you know, mature and rich functionality. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, Francesco, thank you very much for your presentation. Let us now um, switch our webcam off and move on and give the platform to Svetlana on a transformation uh, in a hyper growth situation. So Svetlana, whenever you're ready, over to you. Thank you, Hans. Again, so pleased to be here and presenting to all of you. I'm going to talk about Moderna during the pandemic and the explosive growth that we went through. I think most of you are familiar with the company. I joined Moderna back in September 2020, just a few months before its first COVID vaccine received emergency authorization in the US and around the globe. In the last three years, Moderna grew from under 1,000 employees in US only to over 3,000 and 3,500 employees worldwide. The company also went from clinical to mass scale manufacturing, commercial manufacturing overnight. We've delivered over 800 million doses of COVID vaccine in 2021 alone. At the same time, we went through international expansion as well. We've added about 15 commercial subsidiaries, 20 legal entities across North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific, and multiple distribution partners. We entered multiple late stage trials across several therapeutic areas. In fact, today we have 14 medicines in four therapeutic areas and 46 development programs overall. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what did our FP&A team look like during the beginning of pandemic? Because the company and the finance department was growing so fast, the majority of our people were new. More than 60% of the workforce were less than 12 months of tenure when joined. We had to stand up multiple functions such as commercial and corporate and international finance and tax and treasury basically overnight. Just like all of you, we were also remote during the pandemic. Being new and remote made onboarding very difficult for the team. We had lack of well-defined processes. Many simply didn't exist before. Lack of training and little documentation on how to. We had an FPNA planning tool that was cloud-based at the time, but wasn't used by many, and there was lack of user engagement as a result. And majority of functions had manual and offline models within FPNA itself. On the other hand, we had finance talent that came from big four and well-established companies, both within and outside of biotech space. We knew what good looked like and had good understanding of what the reporting requirements were. We also had a strong desire to change, so we did not have to focus on the change management as much. We knew we could not survive the business growth and support the business as needed with the current tool, with the tools that we had at the time. Our leadership team was also very supportive and ready to invest in capabilities. 
Finally, we were also fortunate enough to have fairly simple data. We had few legal entities to begin with, very few currencies, and not a lot of history. Next slide, please. Since we were growing so fast, we knew that we could not do everything at once. So for us, intelligent transformation meant prioritizing initiatives while enabling the company to grow at the unprecedented pace. For example, we had an existing cloud tool that the team was not using, but no time or capacity to implement a new solution. We had in, an in-house and still have an in-house IT resource that allowed us to improve the system tailor it to each individual functional needs. So we transitioned all of PNA to Excel environment within the existing tool. We gave them the standard freeloading template. Since all of our finance models at the time were offline in Excel, that's what we needed at the time, while it's still a very traditional approach. In parallel, we focused on master data, with reporting needs in mind, cleaning up the chart of accounts and organizing it to fit our needs, creating regional and functional hierarchies, and allowing FPNA to align the reporting structure with the business structure and its needs. We've identified functional champions for the UAT and pilots and implemented quarterly system improvements and postmortems to be based on user feedback. It allowed us to fix a lot of little things that made a big difference to FPNA. We introduced the ability to adjust the forecast without losing the integrity of the data allowing both corporate and functional finance to adjust forecasts as needed without touching the business submission. Everyone knows that the likes to massage the data. We just made the massaging easy and trackable. We've also introduced the use of statistical accounts for KPI and scenario modeling. So even if the models were offline, we could track key metrics and assumptions versus the forecast. We currently are working on a new system implementation that will take into consideration trends and run rate analysis and will allow for predictive modeling and analytics for certain functions and accounts. Again, we would love to transition to everything being done with predictive analytics, but we realize that the time is not yet because we still don't have a lot of history that we can take into account. So we're focusing on pieces of that. And finally, we are currently in the process of transitioning all of our business partner reporting into the cloud and digital platform. Why we are doing that is because given the growth of the business, the amount of legal entities and the functions we're supporting, the standard way of business partner reporting is no longer feasible for us. We're looking for self-service that will allow business to focus on what's relevant to them because some functions would like to look through the vendor and others through the PO. Some like to look at trends versus period to date and so forth. So the cloud and digital platform is allowing us for automated and user interactive experience versus static PowerPoint. And most importantly, it's also allowing finance to save, to shave off days of your regular close and reporting cycle. Slide please. So to close, what are some of the lessons learned? For us, ability to grow and scale with the business was essential. It meant identifying and cross-training the functional champions early on and allowing them to support their functions and all the remote workers. It also meant focusing on automation of manual tasks so that we can do better reporting and assist with QA and QC. As mentioned earlier, we were not set up for the growth, right? We were not set up to do clinical, to separate clinical and commercial manufacturing. We were not set up to report previously at all at the skill and pace. So automating those manual tasks allowed us to find holes in the data and fix it step after step, months after months. We maintain the flexibility for changes to support the business, which has been supported through our in-house IT resource. And that goes both for systems, the processes and the data and analytics. As the business continues to evolve, we continue to evolve the master data and the system with it. We continue to add legal entities and functions across the globe. Traditional business partner reporting becomes less and less feasible, as I mentioned previously, and requires significant headcount and resources from FPNA. This is not the model that Moderna wants to take. So having a cloud-based digital tool that is automated and provides the user interactive experience allows us to do so with fewer people than the normal FP, than the standard FPNA structure. We continue to plan for the range of outcomes because our business continues to change and evolve very fast. Modern is a very fast paced environment. So we have frequent communication and touch points within the whole FPNA as a result. Our processes and systems support scenario modeling. We are focusing again quarterly on automating inputs and outputs in the system that allow for calculations to support those scenarios. 
And once again, having an IT resource or resources within the FP&A team is what allows us to stay nimble and make changes as often as the business needs, which is quarterly for Moderna. And finally, on, on automation, our next focus is on data and analytics. We envision a world where digital reporting does not require PowerPoint or email from FP&A. I urge you to refer to the white paper that will show where Moderna is on some of those metrics. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Svetlana. I think uh, uh, we all think we knew uh, Moderna always existed, always was this big, massive company behind the scene because of all the vaccinations and everything that, uh, and good work you guys are doing, but never knew the story behind two, three years ago, how small you guys were and how you had to grow and how you had to transform to be able to cope with the growth as well as the reporting, as well as the international growth and everything else to go with it. So um, thank you very much for that. That, that is really, really eye-opening. Um, so let us now find out from our audience uh, around um, what do they think is the most critical uh, successful factor for successful finance transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can vote, please. So what is the most critical success factor for a successful finance transformation. So A is aligning on the objectives and scope. B, is it bringing other functions on the journey? Uh, C, is it training and upskilling the finance team? D, is it overcoming cultural resistance to change? I mean, we've seen what uh, Svetlana has just done. What do you think is the most important success factor within your organization. So is it aligning objectives? Is it bringing other functions on the journey? Is it training and upskilling? Um, and then finally, is it overcoming cultural uh, resistance to change? I'll give it another uh, few seconds. I'm now going to close the voting and share the results with uh, our members here. So 26% said aligning objectives, 22% bringing other functions on the journey, 17% training and upskilling, 35 overcoming cultural resistance. Uh, Svetlana, what is your insight into this polling, please? I can speak from Moderna's experience. So for us, it was aligning on the objectives and scope was important in training up and upskilling the finance team were the two most important pieces. And again, it was specific for Moderna because we did not have resistance to change. Fantastic. I think uh, the, the more mature the organization, this is where uh, resistance comes into play. So very definitely you didn't uh, go through that. So thank you very much for that. Let me hide it and, and let us now go and look at um, the question from yourself. So panelists, if you can join me, please, um, that would be great. Um, so here what we have is what would you say has been the biggest challenge in your transformation journey and how did you have to go about uh, dealing with it so if i can ask uh, francesco for his um answer please that would be great francesco sorry i was on mute um i think that um that it's in alignment with what we saw in the poll, right? Uh, the biggest challenge, I would say, too, right? That's internal cross-functional alignment and aligning objective with the scope. What I mean by that, based on my latest experience, um, making this transformation, it's a company priority. It's not the finance priority and controlling priority, right? As we, we like to get that into insight from planning, reporting, any controlling perspective, it is it's, it's supposed to be a company priority not just finance. And second, it's, um, I will say, um, how we deal with that is setting an effective governance in place where we have not just uh, uh, members from uh, finance and controlling community, but, but also from uh, commercial functions who can uh, help us to drive the change. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, can we come to you, please? Yeah, I mean, I think it lines up with your last poll question. It's very much around change management. And, you know, I often think not just about resistance to change, but inertia or competing priorities. Um, and so I guess I always look to, you know, how can I find some time saving things to sort of bring people along the journey for the change? Like very simple example, 
automating a, you know, uh, an activity that takes a lot of time, like calculating analysis of change or quality of earnings or something like that. Thank you. And, and circling back to yourself, Svetlana? For us, it was just keeping up with the pace, honestly, because the business the business continues to change. We keep adding development programs and entities and just making sure that we are we continue with the transformation rather than just fetching things that are not working at the moment. Right. So keeping the long term growth with the short term impact. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your insight into this question, um, everyone. Uh, let us now swiftly move on to our uh, final uh, presentation for today, which will be on accelerating transformation. So if we can turn our webcam off and give the platform to Michael. Um, Michael, over to you, ready when you are. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess for some time, um, at least you know, since the early 2000s, the FP&A community have really understood that their role is changing and it's to lead value creation through business partnering. Um, we know, I don't know whether you, thanks, thanks very much for advancing this slide. Um, we know we need to harness data to be more scenario driven, we need to automate the non-value added tasks, and we need to leverage technology to augment planning and decision making with, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But, um, you know, according to the FP&A Trends Survey of more than a thousand organizations, we know that the average maturity level of FP&A practice is still sort of around about two out of five. And there's all sorts of blockers that might stop us evolving our finance function. Um, so things like um, carving out the capacity to drive or participate in the change activity or um, understanding the target state, perhaps not knowing how or what to transform having to compete with large change projects like digitalization and ERP or being held back by immature or you know, ineffective data strategies. You know, it might be as simple as um, operating in an environment of multiple vendors where you know, we're, we're sort of impaired by endless integration uh, of being you know, locked out from being able to be agile because of all those platforms or even just something as simple as you know, it's really difficult to get a compelling business case together. And all of these things prevent us from evolving the maturity of our FP&A function, and they prevent us from unlocking the value that we can deliver across the organization through business partnering. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see that there are sort of three general approaches that I you know, wanted to sort of talk about, and you could choose to take any of these. So we might lead intelligent transformation internally, and we do this, I guess, if we've got a strong vision of what intelligent planning looks like, and where we have you know, lots of executive commitment and um, maybe finance capability to deliver and drive the change. We might also engage a consultancy to help us shape our vision. Um, and we could really you know, base that on the consultant's experience across a wide range of organizations, which would be a great thing to do. Um, and we can use you know, external consultants to augment our teams with additional capacity and help us to surface and steer um, through a business case with our execs. And but both of these ways are the, the sort of the traditional approaches to transformation They've got their challenges. With internally led projects like our at Kimberly Clark, it's easy for sponsors to switch priorities or to maybe have waning support over time. And many lean organizations lack the capacity or even the capability to drive that transformation internally. Uh, consultant led transformations can be eye-wateringly expensive. Um, and at least a few that I've heard of, um, you know, might consume more than a billion dollars to execute. Um, and what I've seen is, uh, you know, often there's descoping or simplification in order for these projects to be delivered and closed out. And sometimes the degree to which the outcome, you know, doesn't meet the desired target state means that we don't deliver, you know, some or all of the business case benefits. So there is a sort of a new way of, of doing uh, this transformation and it's been really developed out of the experience that we've all been gaining over the last 10 years of, of um, you know, looking at intelligent planning experience. And that's to sort of package up intelligent planning into solutions. You can think about this like the evolution of um, accounting systems to ERP. You know, an accounting system which you post the GL entries in ERP, you know, 98% of the GL entries are, are created by the processes you run. And it's the same thing in planning. You know, 
once you do the planning process, you automatically create a, a P&L, a forecast of P&L balance sheet and cash flow, um, but actually you're focusing on the changes you need to make in the business that, that's driving that. And of course, intelligent planning solutions, they're built on agile planning platforms and they allow you to take a best practice view and then configure it with, or even customize it with your own you know, business processes. And the advantage is that organizations can access the best practice in a really practical and targeted way um, by evaluating and adopting intelligent ways of working, which I was talking about before, and you know, take advantage of pre-integrated AI and ML and harness external data. And you know, all this helps you to leapfrog to a moderately or high maturity of FPA practice. And of course, solutions also come with their challenges as well as difficulties in, you know. such as you know the pace of change you know driving people um, at that high pace is is especially difficult and you sort of have to have the rigor internally to um, to challenge when not to customize just because you choose to do something a different way you know in the past you shouldn't necessarily customize that in the future so so let's drill down a little bit on the next slide so what we see is that intelligent planning encompasses ways of working that allow us to work asynchronously and autonomously. And this is critical, of course, in a decentralized or remote working. It also helps us to unlock the talent pool and build diversity, equity, and inclusion. Typically, solutions would embed all the ways of working that underpin mature FPNA practice, and these are often enabled by technology and data. So, for example, taking planning by exception, we know that uh, not all things have equal weight in our planning process, but we often take a sort of a collectively exhaustive approach to planning. So, so when I led finance business partnering in Kimberly Clark Europe, we planned all of the categories equally. And one of our categories for Europe had a lower turnover than a single power skew in the UK. We definitely wanted to grow that small category and we made plans to do so, but I didn't want finance, sales, supply chain, marketing and others to place the same amount of effort into planning that small category as whatever the outcome, it wouldn't really change any of the decisions that I was trying to make at the Europe level. So taking an outcome-focused approach helps us to allocate resources only to the decisions that really move the needle at the end of the day. And I can use technology to forecast all of my portfolio, which you know doesn't move the needle. And if I implement it really well, it'll give me five to ten percent improvement over humans incorporating. So new trends may be three months earlier than humans and with zero human resource consumption. So solutions also embed this idea of managed by metrics where the strategies of the business are defined and cascaded um, you know, down through the processes and exposing those metrics that really contribute to us achieving the strategic goals. And we do this at the point of planning and decision making. And this ensures that decision makers who are increasingly empowered by managers understand the likely contribution that their decisions will make and the implications of any trade-offs between those strategic imperatives and we make sure that they're considered and understood. So I won't go through all of them but um, solutions embed all of these characteristics um, along with ways of using data to leapfrog to these mature and intelligent planning processes and whilst you might utilize a partner to help with resourcing and change management you eliminate that need to rebuild non ways of working or integrate some of the standard data feeds you might need for your type of business. This allows you to access faster the benefits of intelligent planning, such as unlocking your finance time, uh, your team's time, driving that margin improvement um, with a dramatic reduction in the implementation costs and associated project risks. So my sort of final thoughts are that, you know, when you think about how to mature your finance team and move to intelligent planning, be aware that you've got different options to choose from and just be aware that there's different benefits of each of the approaches of each of the approaches um, that you can choose. Back to you, Hans. Michael, <clears throat> fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, a great session here and, and of course taking us through the different models of uh, best to take that transformation to the next level is very, very important and, and all of your um, uh, insight there as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I think now it's a really good time that we move on to our key takeaways. So I'll, I'd like to ask the other members of the panel to join us 
uh, with their webcam and I've got a, a nice conclusion point here. But just before we go deeper into this, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, we've got a very exciting Q&A session coming shortly. We've got a, a lot of questions, but keep them coming through. We will answer some of them today live. The rest of them we will answer via email. So please keep sending um, your questions to us. So a very good point and very good time to look at the key takeaways, the concluding element of the session we had today uh, on the FPNA maturity model, but also on how to take your transformation to the next level, intelligent transformation, as we call it. So if we if we go to uh, Francesco, Francesco, what is that one or two conclusion point you would like to highlight again um, on your presentation or to the audience, please? Um, thank you, Hans. I think uh, first, I think we need, we need to have alignment between the company uh, strategy and, uh, and the functional strategy. I will say alignment across. Um, functions in the in the company and third um, get the priorities right uh, there are always many projects in place there are always different priorities in place by different functions that are always conflicting uh, projects or resources as part of resources so all of this happening in all the companies but I think get your priorities right and and, and communicate it I think it helped us big time uh, within the, the function to understand what can we do, right? Considering the different elements um, on FPNA to address, this is something that for sure we can address everything at the same time. And we, we want to have an, uh, from the introduction to leading a state maturity level of hitting all of these uh, elements at once. So we, we need to have a plan how we're going to get there for each one. What I mean by that is um, data analytics or people or process. Uh, or technology, I think we need to have a plan for each each of these elements. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you very much for that. Svetlana, coming to you, what will be your key takeaway? For us, it was definitely thinking with an end in mind, so trying to figure out what the reporting structure will look like, not just now, but five, six, ten years from now, and building the business to that and not losing attention on those low-hanging fruit in the meantime while we're planning for the growth and scale up. Fantastic, thank you very much for that. And, and lastly, we'll move on to Michael. Michael, what would you like to highlight to the audience as your key takeaway, please? So I just think it's uh, important to be intentional and choiceful about what you focus on and being able to focus on the critical things that really make a difference in the business is, is so important. And that's where I think that you know, technology can sort of be your friend because it can take all that extra effort um, off the table. So you've got the time to focus on those things. Fantastic. Thank you very much all. Um, just stay on the webcam. We will move on to our next session, which is the Q. Sorry, before the q and I'd just like to highlight in terms of conclusion. Um, in the paper, we've, of course, got the seven steps to FPNA intelligent transformation, which starts with vision, identifying suitable business partner, which Michael's spoken about, pilot running pilot schemes, so starting small, review systems, data, automate, transformation, uh, transform, and then uh, finally, you know, try, fail, learn. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. It is in our paper and you can see the link uh, at the bottom there. So please uh, take time and go through it uh, again. And remember the paper came for, or the maturity model and the paper was by yourself, for yourself. So please go and use it. Um, so now it is time for our uh, fantastic Q&A session. Again, let me remind you, we've still got uh, a time, 12 minutes, so please keep sending your questions. We'll answer a few of them today. The rest we will answer to yourself via email. So please keep sending uh, the questions. So um, very interesting question. So question one, uh, Francesco is coming to yourself. Um, a member of the audience would like to know, how did you do the transformation? Was it, first of all, global business? Where did it start? Is it corporate? Uh, level, did you look at uh, you know a cookie cutter one 
part of the business first. So very similar to you know what we've seen here. So if you can elaborate, please. Sure. Good question. Um, we look at that centrally from the corporate perspective. Um, I think uh, more important thing is we we needed to set to redesign the operating model in controlling our FP&A, how we would like to operate from the reporting, from financial planning analysis, from the business analysis point of view, and setting the sort of the scene from the organization point of view, then, uh, then moving on to the process point of view, looking at technology, what we can have, what we cannot have immediately, and uh, from the data analytics point of view, what sort of uh, what sort of uh, data can turn into insights in a, in a short, medium, long term, et cetera. So it was a central uh, initiative, a corporate initiative from, from controlling uh, to be able to redesign the operating model and how we would like to operate more efficient and effectively. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco. Great, uh, great answer there. Um, our sec next question comes to Svetlana. Svetlana, um, of course, your transformation was uh, on a completely different scale. And uh, we would like to understand how you went through it in terms of uh, in-house, external, a mix of both, some of the stuff that Michael talked about in his presentation as well. Um, can you clarify a little bit, please? Absolutely. So on the fp &A side, we started all internally, right? We have a lot of internal uh, talent. And again, we have an in-house IT resource that sits that, that sit within fp &A. We started with just one people. We are now up to three, right? And that's the main reason. Now that we have gotten some of the foundation under our belt and things that are working, we are actually working with external consultants to help us. We are transitioning the ERP. Again, because we had to drop so fast that we there are a lot of pieces foundationally that are not working. And we're also using external consultants to implement the new financial planning and analysis tool. Right. But again, there is a lot of heavy lifting that's coming internally. So it's the hybrid approach, if I were to refer back to what Michael was talking about. Absolutely. I think this is one of the uh, uh, model that uh, Michael favored as well. And more and more we see uh, companies you know adopting it otherwise you know it, it, everything will tend to take so much longer using internal resource you've got a day job to do as well as anything else uh, and coupled with that you were in a hyper growth situation as well which meant that you know you, you just didn't have the people as well so uh, thank you very much for that uh, Svetlana uh, let us now go to uh, Michael Michael in your experience uh, with all the different organizations you're working with what are they struggling with most in specific and you know if you can help us understand and how do they address it yeah i guess um the big the big problem that i see is that you can't continuously improve to um, well it's very difficult to continuously improve to get to a like a really mature fpna state and that's because there's just not the um capacity to keep the business running and then to make the small changes, you need to make some really big changes. And I think of it more of as, as a you know transformation rather than an evolution. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges is if, if you try and do it in little pieces, you, you might never get there. Um, so it really takes you know a program to sort of sit down and, and figure out you know, how you can change quickly, you know, whichever path you take, um, that's that's the thing. And you know, how how do I see people getting there? I think. You need to get the commitment of um, you know, all of the team and you need to be super aligned around what the goals are and how it's really going to contribute to the strategic imperatives of the business. And then you need to go and get it done, whether you need you know, help from accelerators or solutions or from consultants or just everyone pulling their weight internally. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, great uh, um, answer there, very definitely. I've got a question that's come to myself, actually. So I, I will put that and, and I will uh, help answer this as well. So um, question to me, how popular, how was this popular model developed? I think I, I gave um, the audience an indication in the very beginning, um, you know, five years or so ago, um, it started with the London FPNA board where we started thinking about, you know, what is transformation, what is analytics, and, and where, how can we bring together a map and then we can say, oh, um, this is where my organization is on, on these sort of different levels. So 
we uh, looked at it from a London FPNA board uh, level. We devised it, so we came up with the first uh, maturity model. And then after that, we started um, sharing all of these with all the different boards um, in 16 countries. Today, we have 27. And this was afterwards back with the first paper that came um, in 2020. I think it was June 2020, written uh, partly by myself, Larissa um, as well, uh, um, and sponsored by board. So that was another reiteration of the model with research questionnaires as well as anything else. And finally, we've gone one step uh, beyond that, revamping the model as well as looking at uh, intelligent finance. So that gives you an idea of you know, how the model was developed. And the model is very well appreciated and used throughout uh, most organization, uh, very definitely by our three um, guest members here today as well. Um, that's from me. So I've got one final question that I'd like to put to the three panelists anyway, and it's all about res re resistance um, in transformation. What sort of resistance did you face and how did you deal with it, basically? So, Francis, okay. very quickly, we've only got three minutes or so left, so please, your answer. Uh, I think you're on mute, Francesco. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we're well, good. Uh, well, I mean, not not just to speak of my last experience with Swarovski, but I think in, in, in different companies I I work and join, uh, I mean, there are different elements of, of resistance to change. Either, uh, as I said, is related to um, a strategic resistance, which is means that uh, you might have a an, a functional um, uh, drive to change. And operate more efficiently and effectively within controlling on FPNA, but it's not aligned with the business, or certainly it's not the first priority. Or you might have a resistance to change op tactically, operationally, where centrally at the top everything is clear, but cascade down to the people operating are uh, just the message is diluting, right? So uh, I think that we need to look at things end to end and, and drive the change end to end as well, not just top down or bottom up, but um from from top to uh, to the end i think that's that's the two different components i'll uh, experience in, in different organizations thank you very much uh, francisco uh, svetlana resistance from your um, side of the organization i would say that we just didn't have all the resources at the same time that we needed them right again because we were growing so fast so historically moderna has been an r d company and majority of investment went there so gna was understaffed and under invested right and it was for us it was again prioritizing to see where we can focus the effort and having that those in-house it resources on the fpna side helped us to be nimble and quick right so no not much of resistance just staffing Thank you. And and finally, anything you would like to add, Michael, on resistance? So I think it's just, um, you know, people will continue doing the same thing that they used to do. So if you can get the leaders aligned and if you can get the goals um, so that they're pulling towards the goals of the business rather than the goals of their function, I think that's an important alignment to make and it, it takes a lot of the friction out of the chain. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you very much, uh, um, Francisco and Svetlana for answering those questions as well. We've only got time for uh, this many questions today, but guys, please keep sending them till the end of the session. We will answer the rest via email. Uh, panelists, just stay on the webcam. We've only got a couple of closing comments to make. So there's two upcoming webinars for your diary panelists as well as uh, the audience's diary. Uh, next one is on October the 5th, 2022, where we'll look at managing high growth with dynamic forecasting at Dollar General, so it's a case study. Uh, the second one is on October 19th, and the, here we'll talk about FPNA integration, big thing on the paper as well uh, this time around. So it is now a, a good time for me to say thank you to uh, you, the audience, for making time to attend this. I hope it's been beneficial. We've looked at the maturity model. Uh, we've looked at uh, a model that is created by practitioners, four practitioners, and three great case study, uh, plenty of insight, great questions, and great answers. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, 
members of the panel, thank you very much for all your hard work and effort and insight. Um, and thank you finally to both for uh, making this possible. Um, Finally, just before I say goodbye, this is how we can all keep in touch. So please do keep in touch with us. Uh, before I close um, the, web, uh, the webinar, uh, please just stay for another uh, 15, 20 seconds and give us your feedback on how well we did and what else you would like us to discuss in the next session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is all from us uh, this afternoon. Uh, hope you have a, had a good one. Thank you very much and hope to see you in the next one. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Goodbye. And this concludes our webinar for today. Uh, see you at the next one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.